Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about the cosmology of Dungeons and Dragons. Specifically, I want to look at the what's called the Great Wheel Cosmology, which is the framework of the Forgotten Realms, which is the primary setting of D&D 5th edition, the big major current one, and especially how it relates to real-world historical and especially medieval and scholastic understandings of cosmology, of understanding how the universe works and how creation fits together, because there are a lot of really striking similarities that I don't think we give enough credit to uh, as far as the creators of the uh, of this cosmology, this cosmological system from D&D. So I want to give a brief explanation of each of these two systems. The Great Wheel, as it's called, on the one hand, as our D&D model of the cosmos, and on the other hand, a, uh, a classical medieval understanding based on uh, developments throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the sort of medieval Christian synthesis with Aristotle, on the other hand. So to begin on the one hand, we look to the so-called Great Wheel Cosmology, and this is the current version of the cosmos in 5th uh, edition Dungeons and Dragons, in the, uh, specifically in uh, the Forgotten Realms setting, which is the one that most of the adventures and such are written in. It is a prime material plane, that's the, the sort of normal or real world, at the center, so to speak, and we'll look at why that might be a problematic statement, but regardless. Surrounded by the inner planes, uh, which are bordered in by the ethereal. Uh, this is, um, the ethereal is the sort of ghostly realm where ghosts and spirits and things that are not quite material dwell. Uh, suspended in this are the elemental planes of the four major elements and all of the sort of demi-planes in between them, as well as uh, two mirror dimensions, so to speak, of the prime material plane, those being the Feywild, the, the plane of uh, woodlands and fairy creatures, and the Shadowfell, uh, which is basically the upside down from Stranger Things. Beyond all of this, we have what are called uh, the Outer Planes, and these are the planes which have uh, specific alignments, so lawful versus chaotic, good versus evil, and all of these are settled within what's called the astral plane, uh, which you can analogize to something like space. Now, the particularly interesting part about the, uh, the cosmology here in, uh, in realm space, or in the Forgotten Realms, this Great Wheel cosmology, is very much like the medieval model it has three unique center points. In other words, there are three points, or at least three planes within this cosmology, which can properly be considered the unique center. They're the prime material plane. This is the most obvious, looking at any diagram of it. But you also have uh, the deep ethereal which is the part of the ethereal plane which lies in between all of the elemental planes, the material plane, and the Feywild. It is the connective tissue of the inner planes, so to speak. And uh, we'll look at, we'll look at this by comparison to uh, to the uh, the scholastic model uh, to see exactly what it is that makes this central. Uh, but in purely Dungeons and Dragons terms, it is central primarily because it is equidistant from all other points in the cosmos. Anything can be accessed via the deep ethereal, just like it can be accessed via the material. Similarly, there is a, uh, a place in the astral plane, which is sort of the manifested center of the astral plane, uh, called the Outlands. The Outlands, being in the, uh, in the astral plane, comes to a another unique center point. Uh, this being a grand uh, tower or spire or mountain at the center, at the peak of which floats a city called Sigil, uh, which is uh, known as the City of Doors, because it too is uh, has access to every point in the D&D multiverse. It functions as another unique center of the cosmos. 
So here we have these three unique points, which all of which are functionally speaking centers of the D&D cosmology. We have uh, Earth, basically, um, not technically, but it is the material plane, our, the equivalent to our Earth. And then you have the deep ethereal, which is the realm of change and non-solidity. Uh, we might say potentiality uh, or uh, things like ghosts, ethereal beings, um, ectoplasm, if you will. And then you have the astral plane, that which is centered around and, uh, and involves actuality, things being the, the ultimate of their possibility, their utmost potentiality actualized, centering in a place where even the randomization, randomized effects of magic begin to not function properly as you get closer and closer to the center point of sigil. In other words, potentialities are no longer potential, they're no longer in flux, they're purely actualized. Now we should keep these uh, characteristics of these three unique centers in mind when we shift over to looking at the cosmology understood in the Middle Ages, uh, these, the scholastic model, broadly speaking. Now, the most complete model of the medieval cosmos that we should, I think, look to for a direct comparison would be that proposed by Dante. Uh, this includes the classical Ptolemaic understanding of the various spheres uh, which are concentric and contain the various celestial bodies moving outwards from the Earth. So beginning with the Earth at the center, moving up to the sphere of the Moon, to the sphere of uh, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, etc., all the way out to the stars and ultimately heaven. Uh, the true heaven, that in which God resides. And on this model, um, we also have beneath the Earth being the layers of hell. Now, this may look significantly different, uh, at least on the surface, uh, to how the particularly heaven and hell are depicted in the D&D cosmology, but we will come back to why I think there, that difference is uh, notable, but not, not quite as, uh, as difficult to reconcile as we might otherwise think. Rather, we can look to this model as also, in a very important sense, having three unique centers. We have, first and most notably, the Earth. Our realm of being lies at the center of this cosmological model, both because all of the spheres rotate around the Earth, with the Earth at its center, but then also because we are at a sort of midpoint between heaven and hell, between actuality and uh, pure potentiality, between being and non-being. We exist in flux, in change, in the Middle Earth, so to speak, hence, of course, Tolkien being a medievalist. So Earth is one of these unique center points, but we also can look downwards or inwards, and we can look at Hell as being a sort of center point to this cosmological model. And this is because, uh, as we understand it in, in the divine uh, in the divine comedy, and as well as uh, traditional notions of Hell being being downwards or beneath the Earth. We have Satan affixed at the very center, at the lowest point in hell. But what this also means, functionally, is that it is more central than the center point of Earth. But that's not quite right. It's rather that the nature of being in hell, and this applies to Satan and the demons as well as the spirits of the damned, uh, is that they are curled in upon themselves, uh, to use uh, a borrowed translation from curvatus in se, uh, which is how it's described by Aquinas and some of the other medievals. What this means is that they are focused entirely inwards upon themselves, both selfishly, pridefully, all of the deadly sins, of course. This also applies to hell itself. Hell itself is an ultra-concentration of, uh, of all that is missing, all that is improper, incorrect, uh, pure potentiality. We lose all that makes us actual, all that connects us to God and therefore to being. That is the state of being in hell. It is the closest to a state of pure potentiality that one could possibly reach, and therefore before passing entirely out of being. 
and it's also the ultimate state of focusing purely in on the self, but with no focus on one's own attributes. So no focus on one's virtues, or no, no focus on one's relationships, or the things that settle us within our real world. And so we have hell being, at least symbolically, central to this model. In other words, uh, it is in the center, we mean. Now, of course, we also can go the other direction, and we can look to heaven, God being, uh, metaphysically speaking, purely actual. And if God is purely actual, and God is uh, that from which all things come, in other words, the creator of all being, then that makes God also a unique center. The central figure of heaven becomes the central figure of all the cosmos from which all things are equidistant. We speak of those in hell cutting themselves off from God. That is somewhat correct, but it's more, it's more correct to say that they have attempted to turn themselves away from God by turning in on themselves. They still remain in, in God's presence, so to speak, because God is omnipresent. Equidistant from all points in the cosmos, to reuse a phrase we've already used. And now we can look to both of these systems in comparison to one another. We can look to the Great Wheel, and we can look to uh, Dante's cosmology, you know, Dante's medieval cosmology. And we can see that they both have these three unique points at the center. We have that which is lowest, and that which is the most, uh, the most potential, the most formless, being the deep ethereal and hell. We have that which is in the middle, that which is the material, that which is the here and now, the this-worldly, in both cases, well, earth or the prime material plane. And then we have that which is purely actual. There is no chance, there is only will, there is only perfection. And we see this in uh, the Outlands, and in Sigil in particular, in the Forgotten Realms, and we see this in Heaven with God, in the real historical uh, comparative example. Now, why is it that this maps on insofar as it does, but there are these important differences? Why is it that the, that the heavens and the hells in the D&D cosmology, for example, are in a very different location? For that, we have to look to the nature of good and evil in reality, and the nature of good and evil in the Dungeons & Dragons system. In the Dungeons & Dragons system, good and evil are dualistic opposites. Both exist and oppose one another, just like chaos and law independently exist and oppose one another. Both have being. Whereas in reality, as I've explained in other lectures, of course, good is fundamental. Good exists. Whereas evil is merely a privation, a corruption, uh, or a lack of goodness, a lack of being, a deficiency in being. So there is no metaphysical parity. There is no opposition between two fundamental forces, or in the D&D case, four fundamental forces, if we go with good, evil, law, and chaos. Rather, all we have is good on the one hand and nothing on the other. The nothingness of evil in real metaphysics means that it is precisely equivalent to non-being. The closest we can get to that, even theoretically, is that which is pure potential, it has no actuality, but it's purely open to any being that could shape it. Um, this is uh, the kind of thing that Aristotle referred to as prime matter. Um, see, Aristotle and those who followed him so form and matter as roughly equivalent to actuality and potentiality, good and being. Form is what gives actuality to something, and matter is the potential that takes that form. So think of it this way. Prime matter is potentially anything, but actually nothing. It could be shaped into anything by an act of creation. But itself has no properties. It has only being, but no no particular characteristics, traits, properties, etc. It is matter, but it has no shape, it has no size, it has no color, no weight. Any of these properties that we would expect matter to have, any matter of any configuration to have, 
prime matter is without it. All it has is being undifferentiated. By contrast, we have pure being, or pure actuality. This is, of course, God. God is the only that, that than which no greater can be thought, that which exists purely of and through itself, being itself, ipsum esse subsistens, subsistent being, something like that. And what this means in the context, in, the, by, in this comparison, is that the, the closest thing we can find to pure potentiality or prime matter is something like ectoplasm, the foundational constituent of the deep ethereal. Because things on the, on the ethereal plane and the lower planes in general, not the lower planes, the, uh, the inner planes, I should say, in general, are closer to being potential and they are themselves less actualized, they are less differentiated. So if we look at the deep ethereal, we have ectoplasm, which is nothing in particular, but it could be anything. This is why, uh, in game mechanical terms, um, magical effects with which create and shape things have a heightened effect on these planes of existence. And this is also why the elemental planes exist here, because elemental matter exists in a state of pure potentiality. It is fire itself, earth itself, water itself, air itself. It has not been shaped or molded into any particular configuration of matter. Like a human person is a configuration, again, according to this model, is a configuration of the four elements in different ratios and different configurations. It is matter, which has been informed. It has been given form. So we have these, these, uh, uh, these planes of the elements being closer to the prime material, closer to the center point, and further away from the other center, so to speak, which is the ethereal, the deep ethereal. In contrast to this, we have sigil and the outlands, at the center of which magic ceases to function. Uh, even the gods lack any power, and the reason they lack any power is that they lack the power to change things, because that is what power is. Power is the ability to actualize potential, and if there is no potential to actualize, nothing can be actualized and nothing therefore can be changed. This is the argument, functionally speaking, this is the argument for God's immutability that you find in Thomas Aquinas and in other scholastics. And if this is the case, if everything is, if everything which exists at the center of this, at the, of the center of the astral plane, I should say, if everything there is purely actual or as close to purely actual as is possible to get, and what we have here is roughly the equivalent to heaven. The trouble is, is we have this dualistic or quadralistic model where we have these four fundamental forces which are independent of each other and opposed to one, one another. Good and evil are opposed forces which exist, which have their being. They are formal structures of reality. And the same applies to law and to chaos. And they just like the four elements of matter can be configured into different combinations, the d d cosmological model has these four fundamental forces doing the shaping. Good and evil, law and chaos, compete, contest, and combine to form and shape and create and combine matter into particular things, which we will find ultimately and primarily on the prime material. Now, this is a mostly coherent model. The only problem, of course, being that the issues with du with dualism, uh, dualism with respect to good and evil, especially. Again, uh, see other lectures if you want to see a problem with this. Uh, but within its own model, if you accept this premise that, that dualism uh, is or at least can be true, then what we have is good, or what we ought to properly and metaphysically call good, uh, is centered around uh, the astral, sigil. And evil, or what we ought to properly and metaphysically call evil, is centered around the deep ethereal, non-being, or at least pure potentiality. And the mix of the two, where they meet this other center, so to speak, is Earth. Or technically, the prime material plane, where most of our adventures take place in this mix of, of, uh, of formal forces, that which shapes things, and that which is shaped, these elemental forces. 
So I hope this has, uh, on the one hand, helped to explain both versions of cosmology here, at least to uh, to some degree, uh, and then also brought up this comparison. And I want to give uh, give extensive credit to uh, to anyone who anyone and everyone who has worked on uh, on this cosmological model. What really impresses me about this is that uh, even though it has this alignment system uh, built into it, which is which is incredibly alien to the medieval or the Christian mind, it still manages to capture a great deal of the the structure and aesthetics of a medieval cosmological model, which after all is what we're trying to do when we're playing a medieval fantasy game. We're trying to get something to feel like we're in a fantastical, strange version of the Middle Ages. And I think that that this does a spectacular job at doing that. So hopefully we learned something, maybe about the real world, maybe about the games that we play. And hopefully I will see you next time. Goodbye.